Hello and welcome back to another VOD review on Clutch Gaming. Today will be Clutch Gaming versus FlyQuest. This is Sunday's game, week four, day two. Um, no announcements for today like in yesterday's video. I am feeling a bit better, so let's go ahead and get right into it. So first with the bands, uh, Urgot coming out and Cassiopeia coming out. Extremely standard flex picks. And then this is like, probably the last game where you're going to see a whole lot of Lucian bands. Um, since they are still playing, or no, are they playing in patch um, 9-3? They are playing in 9-3, so possibly just a, a lack of comfort on other picks uh, leads FlyQuest to think. If they give Clutch Gaming, a, a, a team that really likes to play early anyway, um, something like Lucian, that it could be extremely beneficial. Clutch Gaming taking out the Nocturne, Orn, and Alistar. These are very clearly um, odd. And why, why I would consider them odd is because if it doesn't seem like one of these could ruin your team composition in any way, um, and of course like these are all really difficult and annoying things to play against, um, then it's probably also something that, uh, that these, these people are very comfortable on. And that's okay. So no issues here. Open champion comes up. First pick Ezreal. So this is this is as we understand one of Clutch Gaming's most important picks. They like to give Ezreal to Piglet because they feel as if having a safe bottom lane will make things a lot better, and they're going to play early mid game anyway. Um, I. At this point, it, it, it's kind of not surprising that I think in any draft they're going to pick Ezreal in the first rotation. If it's up or it's not banned. I'd be a little more interested to see a draft where Ezreal is banned, just to see what Clutch Gaming picks anyway. But I doubt anybody will ban Ezreal, because no one's really afraid of Ezreal. So. Hmm. Very interesting. FlyQuest responds. Zoe Thresh. So the Thresh is a more interesting pick. Zoe right now is just really strong. So, and, and for anyone who wants to have any ideas on what you can pick into Zoe, uh, Fizz with Electrocute is actually a really strong counter. Um, Echo ends up being okay. Um, but this is probably not something that will come out in NA ever, just because Echo's a, a, like a 1-3-1, one, one, like, necessary champion um fizz you don't necessarily have to one three one it's all about early game um it's all about snowballing um and you can still do like scrappy team fights in the mid game come late game you're not so great um whoa gangplank this one's a little bit out of the water so to say um you, Gangplank is really good because you can W all of the all of the uh, bubbles that Zoe throws, um, and you end up just farming the lane pretty freely. And then by the time you get Trinity Force, you can actually take away Zoe's um, Zoe's priority in the lane. And whenever Zoe gets close anyway, you just Q her, um, and usually get a Kleptomancy proc, and and you can just push her out of lane over and over again because Zoe has no defenses. And she has no, um, no specialties like that. Now, the, something that's also on the tier list against Zoe is LeBlanc. So we are going to see that come out in this draft. And I'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, but these these are general things that people like to pick into Zoe. Galio has always been really popular into Zoe. But I really don't like this pick. I, I personally am not a big fan. Um... There, when Galio was really strong, then yes, it was super good. But when now that Galio is not so strong anymore, or back when Zoe was so overpowered that like nothing could stop her, um, Galio was he was almost almost good enough. But uh, by by uh, by like level five, Zoe just starts taking lane priority, and then Galio can't leave lane without missing minions or losing turret health. Because he's either going to stay in lane and get poked down and get pushed in, or um, 
he he wants to somehow find a window to move an ult to other lanes. But anyway, that's just a little insight on on what can beat Zoe, because if you think about it, there's like nothing else that beats Zoe right now. She is really good, and that's why that's why we see her coming out as blind pick in multiple regions. Thresh is just also pretty good right now. Due to how the meta has changed, Thresh has come back. Um, and a lot of people say that that Thresh is a little bit too strong right now. I really don't think Thresh is too strong. They are nerfing him. I don't know what they're doing. I guess the patch notes come out tomorrow, and I haven't. I don't really look on PBE. Um, but he he can be a jack of all trades, good and bad, aggressive or defensive. So you see Clutch Gaming going with Braum as a response to Thrash, so this is fine. Um, this really says that they're trying to hold on to the lane. And then you see the counter pick come out from Zoe. So the counter pick of LeBlanc into Zoe says that one, LeBlanc wants to jump onto Zoe when she has no ult. And even when she has ult, it makes Zoe's movements really predictable. So LeBlanc is able to chase her around. LeBlanc has four blinks. Or well no. Let's let's be very, very clear. Two dashes, not playing smite, and two blinks. So this can help a lot with dodging bubbles and um, and paddles. Fake spelling. And because you can dodge a lot of bubbles and paddles, you can also exert a lot of pressure. And LeBlanc is also generally a like snowball-y assassin. So this seems like a great champion to put DeMonte on. Um, so I, I actually I really like how Clutch Gaming's draft is going on right now, because I feel like it's exactly what they want up until this point. Um... FlyQuest respond with Kai'Sa. This is like this is obvious. Um, FlyQuest is is drafting by the book right now. Um, dra FlyQuest is just drafting like the easiest thing that they can see in their mind. They say let's get strong pick potential. Then let's go ahead and get some get some Kai'Sa because there's a free bottom lane. So now we have late game. So. Not a whole lot of tank, but definitely really strong carries and, and a good bottom lane uh, that where where they'll have a hyper carry that's safe. So second ban phase comes through. FlyQuest decides to ban out junglers. Jarvan and Olaf taken away. Um, Olaf's pretty good into Zoe, so that that's definitely a good ban. And then Jarvan is also pretty good into Zoe, but also very good into um, Kai'Sa. So. Good options, good options. Um, Clutch Gaming comes out with a Jace ban and a Silas ban. Um, the more popularity Silas has, and like the weirdness he can take into team comps, and if Clutch Gaming was planning on picking Karthus later in the game, Silas just ends up being a better pick. So this is alright as a ban. Um, and then they have Jace as a ban. So. Jace is strictly a ban in the top lane, meaning that Clutch Gaming have something that is probably going to be weak to split pushing, and they do not want their top to be like too weak. They want they want the top lane to be kind of nothing. Like they want nothing happening. I don't know how to explain what Clutch Gaming want, but I, I really want to try and put myself in their shoes so that I can understand what they're doing at this point, because when I when I see a team going like this, I really want to know like what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so I mean, Jace is really good in the, in the Scion, and Scion's a, a solid champion um, and reliable in cases where you you need something that is one going to hold a lane and two probably won't int. And three, be pretty strong in mid game, and a meat shield throughout the game. So he's he's okay as a top laner. Um, 
He can definitely hold a lane a lot better than Orin can ever since the Orin nerfs. And he's probably one of the best lane holders. Um, he's not so good as Yorick right now. Yorick is a little bit better in, in the same situation given the same variables. Like you want someone who's going to have pressure in their lane, keep the push, be a tank, um, and then can also be like really annoying and not and not int. So both are both are interesting. FlyQuest oh wait, I, I never talk I never said FlyQuest picked Lee Sin. <laughs> FlyQuest picked Lee Sin. But this is this is just standard. Like us want more pressure. They're saying, oh with the Zoe we need we want we want pick pressure, we want a roaming unit. Lee Sin's popular, there's there's not a whole lot else to say there. Um and then clutch gaming this is this is where I begin to question clutch gaming's draft. And that's why I talked about Scion first, because immediately when I saw the draft before I started the video because um, I, I was talking with a couple people, I don't know if they watch my videos or not, um, in the Clutch Gaming Discord uh, while the game was happening, but I did not watch the game. And they did, I was aware of the draft that Clutch Gaming had, but I was not aware of the pick order. And the pick order up until this point um, is actually extremely good. Now... The Karthus pick here I find really odd, and there's there's several reasons that I find it odd. So one, CG is an early game team. So this this is a late game champion. But this is not just a late game champion that's scaling linearly, he's scaling exponentially. And when something generally scales exponentially, uh, it's because their early game is actually garbage. Like, like complete garbage. Um, and what that means is that, especially against something like Lee Sin, Karthus is really weak. Karthus is also not going to be putting um, any pressure on the map. And even after level six, like he's I guess he's a walking requiem, like, oh no, I'm Karthus Jungle, I can gank all three lanes at this at the same time. Like that was a really good meme when when Dyrus did that and got a pentakill. But um that it doesn't work with the CG comp. What CG needs is pressure to get the LeBlanc rolling. And they can actually, even with Ezreal, can abuse the bottom lane. And sure, there weren't a whole lot of um, options that were like super good because Jarvan and Olaf were banned, along with Nocturne. And banning Nocturne is basically asking the enemy team to play Zoe. So like, I feel like that was the whole plan anyway. Um, but what you can also play here is Gragas. Um, if you want to be super standard... No, I, you can't. I would not play Sejuani here, only because she doesn't offer enough early pressure against Lee Sin. Hmm. I'm gonna leave in the video description a couple more champions that would be super good as a jungler here, but I I think Gragas would be insane. So. Two doesn't fit with team comp, and so what I what I just explained was an example of count like was a bad interaction of win conditions. So this bad interaction is that Karthus is going to only farm and that LeBlanc and Ezreal want to get leads and pressure and move around the map a lot. And that is not what's good. That's not what Karthus is going to be doing. Scion's great at that. Scion and Karthus go together. Um, but Scion doesn't really care what comp he's in 
he's just going to fill the role of being a tank and a lane holder. But when you have when you have this, like it's nice, the Braum is nice, but there's think about how much reliable wave clear you have. You are not holding this until like a six item game. Like this is not gonna be like a Karthus 1v5 game. And even if you are gonna get to six items, um, Ezreal and, and LeBlanc are not like the best six item champions. So this this I find really odd, and I, I think this is a mistake by, by Clutch Gaming. And I think I see it from the Silas ban as to that they were actually... This was not a... This pick was premeditated. This was something that they wanted to draft, at least since the second ban phase when they banned Silas. And because I find that I, I think there's like an actual error like this is not a communication error this is not a draft error this is a premeditated pick that I think clutch gaming just has a bad idea of how this was going to fit in the team comp um, any early pressure can get the game rolling and if the game's rolling LeBlanc and and any early pressure champion can become a roaming unit that will destroy Lee Sin, um, and, and Zoe won't be able to roam out of her lane. Um, Kai's is going to be super weak under tower, even if she has a Thresh. They don't have a tank to, to help defend the bottom tower. Their entire bottom side of the map is, is just weak. The top side of the map is not weak, but it's vulnerable anyway, if they can, if they can put Riven behind. Um, so Flyclass, yeah, their last pick is Riven. Riven is a counter to Jace. Riven is, or not Jace, the, to Scion. Not the most popular one. I would prefer to have a Fiora on my team. So I, I do find this has to be like a, a Viper request. Um, but uh, other, actually, yeah, isn't Viper a Riven player? Doesn't he like Riven? I'm not really sure. But I, I would have picked Fiora 10 times out of 10. Which is... Equally good as a as a Scion counter. So actually, it might be better as a Scion counter. But but Riven's great at snowballing the lane and and making Zion Scion like useless. So let's go ahead and get into the game. That like these are actually really interesting drafts. I'm not disappointed. I just I do see error on the side of watch because i see what they were going for with their draft um and then they just messed it up on the last pick but that was their plan the whole time so i i don't like it now fly quest draft is a little bit different so this is going to be your pick champion team comp They're going to focus on getting picks, and they're going to focus on snowballing. This entire part of the map, Leeson's going to play strong side, top side. And he's going to help get snowballing the Riven and the Zoe. And if he can get the snowballing Riven and the Zoe, one, Riven is going to completely crush his lane. And if Karthus comes anywhere near um, Riven, she's just going to 1v2. And then Lee San can start focusing on getting Kaiso gold because small investments on Riven lead to big gains. It's like it's like buying a stock for a tenth of its value and then selling it later for the actual value. But your your investment on Kaisa you gets really small gains. Like she'll eventually become useful, like two items, three items. Um, but until about two items, she's not the best champion. So by when 20 minutes comes in, this champion kicks in. So right, right about when Ezreal kicks in to drive, uh, Kaisa also kicks in the drive. And basically, like who has a lead, and who can who can take advantage of that lead more, um, will be the more useful ADC at that time. It will usually be Ezreal because he always takes Kleptomancy. Um, but you know things happen. So it's, here's our teamfight ADC, here are our pick champions, 
Um, let's get picks and then let's um, let our ADC win our so win the fight. Um, and let's just like be completely obscene. And CG has a pretty similar team composition. Um, it's just more. It's a more kite based. messy fights so like think about it this way if if fly doesn't have big leads they will not win team fights not until like maybe kaisa is like super strong and then maybe they can win fights but probably still not because Sion's just going to stand in front of of scion and then uh ezreal and leblanc are just going to one shot a carry one at a time Okay, so I got done with the win conditions just in time for Lyra's early gank bottom. So, uh, okay. So, if I were to test anyone who watched the other video, what does Lyra like to do? He likes to early gank bot. So you can't you can't level two gank as Karthus. You just can't. But you can definitely level three gank. So what does he do? He full he full clears and he he full clears to level three. He doesn't actually full clear. He gets level three and he comes straight bot. Let's actually look at his pathing. Okay. So he starts blue and just paths straight towards bot from there. This is unfortunate for a lot of reasons. So one, Lyra early ganking bot is very predictable. Just because it's a habit that he has. So, um, in in game theory, in behavioral game theory, we like to talk about the utility, um, the utility of something, and the utility of something also relies on whether or not the the behavior is predictable, and whether or not your action being known to the enemy in a in a um, in a static game, whether or not um one one person has to choose their action before the not before the other enemy or if they have to choose at the similar at the, at the same time like whether or not your your action is known or not is sometimes important and this is this is in behavioral game theory and in, in an evolutionary game that definitely is important and if we were to treat it like a static environment where um where so to say in every game lyra says okay well i do bot jungle i gank bot and if at success i get scuttle crab and i go top and if i if i'm not going to gank bot then i'm just going to full clear and back that seems to be what lyra does and more often than not lyra likes to gank bot early especially when he's on blue side so Lyra's on blue side, and we actually we, I could look at all the CG games and, and tell you how many times he's ganked bot, but it's been it's been a couple, um, and he he is it's very obvious and clear that he likes to early gank bot, and it's very clear of the conditions that are necessary for him to gank bot. So that behavior has a high probability um, factor, and because that probability factor um, not only is not only is based on on like oh like is someone gonna miss a skill shot it's like not something that you can like kind of guess or you can compute like um but it it's actually you just saying well okay i can count every time that the this person has had the opportunity to do something and based on how many opportunities that he's had to do it he's chosen that opportunity this many times and if that number is significant, if it even happens to reach anywhere above 50%, then you're, or I mean, if you only have two options, then if they're not 50%, then there's clearly 
at the extremity of things a, a favor towards one typical behavior, then you know that then you know that he is probably going to commit that um, action more often than not. So Lee Sin actually doesn't path towards his um, blue buff. He actually he's not even level three, but he doesn't need to be level three to stop this gang. He gets here just in time to get the the triple kill. And this that's sad. I would have I don't I mean maybe JJ with one kill is nice. I guess that's for his if he wants to back he can get a he can get a support item really early. That's fine. That was probably fine. Um okay, so that was enough explanation about why why that went wrong other than the fact that Karthus is it's not a champion that is supposed to really apply early game pressure for exactly what we just saw. Karthus is level 3, Lee Sin's level 2. Karthus gets one shot and then he's useless. Um, So I've definitely shared a lot of my, my opinions on Scion. I think Scion is like a tier 1 champion, but like low tier 1. And here's, I mean, you, you definitely have a lot of different definitions for what tier could possibly mean. God tier, when I say something is god tier, I mean it's actually just broken. There's like, there's something wrong with it, it needs to be picked or banned. Everything in my book that is not broken is tier 1, uh, if I think that it's high priority in some way, shape, or form, for some reason. I think that there are other tier 1 top laners that are higher priority than Scion, um, and and this, this also will depend on meta. Your opponents, like, Possibly if your top laner is, is a carry player or if he's not a carry player. Um, but I think Scion's a low tier 1 champion. Tier 2 champions are, you should never blind pick them. So tier 1 you're talking about, like you can blind pick it, you can get countered, but it probably won't make a huge difference. God tier means you probably can't get countered by anything, like release Zoe or... I mean, like, I have to, I have to reference things that are really old. I mean, Yorick at any point in the entire nine years of playing League of Legends, there's not really anything that really counters him. For a while after they did the rework, I guess Cho'Gath was pretty good at that. Um, but he's he's never been that great. Did it, did we just spend an extra flash there? Why are you flashing there? So for those of you who don't know, Zoe gets a couple things when she uses a summoner spell. One, um, it procs her passive. So whenever she uses a spell, she gets an empowered auto attack. Two, it shoots out the the sparkles that deal damage. I don't really know how to explain that better. I'm pretty sure literally the ability is called Yay Sparkles or something. And then three, it gives a movement speed buff. Um, so this is actually the, the key here. If Zoe just flashed, like one, she has a movement speed buff. If two, you flash on her and she has another uh, ability, like there is no way you're going to catch her. Not that like Lee Sin probably couldn't. Like like Lee Sin could even just walk here anyway and W. There's no reason why why Viper can't get over the wall if necessary. 
Not that I think that Fly wants to fight this. I just think that it's pretty easy for Pobelter to get out. And that Huni with zero mana, and this is like, this might not even be something that Fly was thinking about. But a zero mana Scion is not very scary. Like his auto attack damage is not that high. His auto attack speed is not that high. Uh, and then adding on, adding on top of that, that he has zero abilities to cast. And he's literally just a walking piece of meat. Um, if you're able to get then at that point, like Karthus doesn't do that much damage. If you're able to get onto LeBlanc, like with a with a Riven ult, you, this this even becomes a winnable fight. Even if Zoe ends up having only a half of her HP at the beginning. But Zoe ends up getting any, any, away anyway, just because she's naturally naturally really strong. She does lose both of her sums, so like. You know, quick game state. Quick game state. Zoe has no sums. She is really vulnerable. So if there's anything good going for CG right now, it's Demonte has a huge advantage in his lane. On the other side, um, Viper ends up having an advantage on Cyan because Cyan wasted his his flash, um, which I don't think was good for the barrier. I think I think once they got Zoe's flash, I don't think that flashing on Zion to take Zoe's barrier is worth it. Maybe it is, like maybe Demonte will solo kill Poe Belter, but maybe I I don't know. I, I don't know if that'll happen. Poe Belter is probably gonna play it pretty safe. Um and most Zoe players in this matchup understand they need to play it really safe. He bought Mercury Treads already. So it, it would be pretty hard for Demonte to kill him. Not to mention that Barrier has a really short cooldown. It's only three minutes. Um, so I think it won't even be up by the time Demonte's... Uh, or I think it'll already have been up by the time Demonte's Ignite is going to be up. Which tends to be an issue. Since he probably wants to have Ignite for that. So that he can just like one-shot her almost. Well, let's see, Demonte has a blue buff, like, does he play this lane aggressive at all? Flyger for the early dragon, just because this is free. Uh, Demonte doesn't look like he's gonna do anything. He's scared. So this is completely free, like, one, even though Zoe's, like, behind, she doesn't really have to worry about getting ganked, because the, the, like, there is no Karthus gank. There's a Karthus ult. She can't get too low. So she can't she can't lose more than 80% of her HP. Because Karthus ult will definitely do about 20% of her HP. This is not what's supposed to be happening, but this is a clear result of what happened during the first gank. Like, uh, you generally don't see Kaisa with so much control of the lane. Um, but Ezreal doesn't exactly have an advantage of any kind. That is unfortunate. Why didn't he auto there? He could have gotten Demonte to half. Small errors. Yeah, it's really, really unfortunate for the for the CG bottom lane, because ideally at this point, like if they are just have a little bit lead from um, from Klepto, um, and Wild Turtle didn't have that much gold for a, for a BF sword. Like he he backed on something else. I don't know. I don't know what Kaisa build is after the after the new changes. I don't. I think she still would go against Um. So so if she had just like pickaxe or something, they could definitely be going for for turret health and still just poking them down over and over. Oh, 
Although, remember that they aren't really supposed to win 2v2 anyway. Until Kai'Sa has a little bit more damage. Just because Braum is really good at being um, defensive, playing reactive in the 2v2. But Thresh offers more damage and more engage. And it's just overall pretty strong. And he's not very tanky yet. But once he's tanky, then... Like, there will be a mid-game in which these two will 2v2 these two. But then it will reverse again in the late game. Kaisa ends up being pretty good in late game against Ezreal. So Santorin going for a free Rift Herald because he has so much pressure on, on his top lane and his mid lane. Zoe is not giving up the matchup. So I, I hate to say it, but Demonte had a little bit of a a little bit of an opening there playing for Poe Belter's no flash. But he wasn't able to take advantage of it at all. And if you're picking LeBlanc as a counter pick into Zoe, you want some kind of advantage, and he doesn't even have a CS advantage. In fact, he's at a CS disadvantage of 9, which frankly is quite a bit. Maybe that'll change to 8 here, but... Yeah. Ideally, you want to be ahead by 10, not behind by 10. Piglet's so close to a turret plating. There he goes. That's really good for him. Okay, yeah, that's a little bit better. Like those kinds of consistent trades that LeBlanc can make are, is something that she wants to look for to try and take an advantage in the lane. So CG has to be careful about the Rift Herald. Fly wants to use the Rift Herald probably in the next minute. Because what that would do is give them a whole lot of um, gold from turret plating. But they might not want to spend it very quickly if they don't think they can also get the tower. So they will probably get the tower here. Nobelter just hit a sick Q onto Demonte. Um, or they're at least going to get all the plating. And then this will lead to first tower, even if they don't end up getting it here. Because remember that you want... Ideally, Rift Herald does one of two things. One, first Blood Tower. Just because it gives a lot of extra gold. Or two, a, um, a Tier 2 Tower. So, this will be your, your early Rift Herald. And this will be your late Rift Herald. Depending on how the game goes. Early Rift Heralds are nice when you, you're playing these like Snowball top, top strong side top uh, comps that are pretty good on red side. They work, they work just as well on blue side. So, if not, if not better, assuming you have a really good jungle matchup. But CG, CG have a better like strong side bottom side. They just can't really do anything with it because they don't have a jungler that, that cares whether or not they have a strong side or a weak side. They, don't, they only have a jungler that, that farms, and that, that's it. And he can't even really counter jungle because Lee Sin will just like look at him crooked and, and he'll die. Which is unfortunate. So let's speed up the the video a little bit, just because we're been looking at it a lot now. That was good damage, but it's way too late. LeBlanc can LeBlanc would want to get an, an advantage before now. An advantage now won't mean a whole lot. 
She can make those trades and win those trades better a lot earlier in the game. So this rotation is good. That was really well played by Piglet. So they they took advantage of an error, used used Ezreal's mid game power spike to to take advantage of that error, and then took a tower by making a rotation after they took advantage of an error. So that was really good by CG. So they're entering they're entering their comfort zone, and I'm gonna be like officially labeling CG's comfort zone between 15 and 25 minutes, since that's that seems to be what they like to play for. Um, that's definitely an Ezreal kind of thing. You start playing 15 to 25, and you stop playing 25 to 30. And what I mean by that is, like, this is when you start to play aggressive with Ezreal. Um, team fighting, kite carrying, stuff like that. And this is when you want to end the game. You want to you make big plays. Um, you're really strong. You're on your 3-item, 4-item power spikes. And... And you know your five item, six item Ezreal kind of falls off, so he's not exactly like super awesome. Or well, I mean, six, I I really mean five item Ezreal. Like when I say six item, I mean boots. Ezreal does have a build. I guess the new build is a four item build out of five items, not counting boots. That's always been really weird to me, seeing Ezreal as like a like mid late a late mid game champion, so to say, depending on how you want to define mid game. I like to define it based on items and level. Some people just like to define it on minute mark, but I think that's a little bit weird. Interesting. Okay, so let's watch this in slow mo. So CG say, okay, well, we're not interested maybe completely in the dragon, and we're not going to risk anything for it, so that's fair. I'm okay with that. They say, we are going to engage this because we think we can win the fight, and I think that's fair as well. I definitely have stated that two kite carries. Two kite carries, a tank, and an execute, an AoE damage will definitely. This will be your like diver, so to say, because it, it doesn't really matter if Lyra dies. A diver, two kite carries, and two tanks. Like that is a very good team fighting team comp. Um, it would be better if they had more CC and engage. Since their only reliable engage is Scion, and that's not even, not even really reliable. Really would have evolved Gragas. Gragas would have been great here. Imagine this not being. Imagine like this being followed up with a with a Gragas Flash E combo, like right onto those two right there. That would be nasty. And then fish fishing like feeding them back towards the the carries. That would be insane, but um, you know, conditions wouldn't be completely the same. Okay, so CG got a fight they wanted, they traded 2 for 0, they're moving towards mid, they'll probably get most of mid tower, might get mid tower here. Good, good, good. CG also have pushed top. So CG have pushed bottom. So anyone who's already backed at that point is definitely going to move top, take the advantage of the push top, and try to finish on top tower. Since top tower is definitely below 50% HP.
Let's go back to two times. I don't really know how long this game is. That is unfortunate. Didn't he realize they were there? Like, yeah, he saw both of them. Oh. He just assumed that they didn't have vision. That's a little bit irresponsible. He doesn't know that they don't have vi or they, he doesn't know that they don't have vision or they do have vision. Uncertainty is fear. Uncertainty is certain fear. That is the thing you should be fearful of the most. Okay, so there, so there, there went the top rotation into getting top tower and getting some real tempo for CG. Instead, um, Fly got the the first the first jump on it, and now they get top tower and they get to keep tempo in terms of gold. Not like not like one thousand less than one thousand gold at this point in the game really means a whole lot. Like you're looking at less than three percent. So. Not a whole lot going on. Tickle fight in the side lane though, it's pretty interesting. So, let's just recap on what, what CG's doing. CG have set up for 1-3-1. Fly of 1-4. One, so until, until CG's 1 gets to the top, CG center, their three, needs to make sure that they can wave clear nicely. This is not your favorite setup for wave clearing. Ezreal is pretty horrible at wave clearing. Um, and Karthus is just squishy. So the, the, be the good part is that they have Braum, and Braum can at least deny Zoe from being, being able to just shit on everybody. They go ahead and they win top tower here. So LeBlanc's going to continue and Fly's going to get Dragon. Wave gets lost. Zoe goes to pick up that wave. And it's a full reset. This is like really slow. Like, like what did she buy something big? Yeah, she did buy something big. She must have been holding gold for... I guess she did farm all the way from here. Okay. I just want to make sure that CG is playing at a pace. That is game winning. Is that something you want to be intact in in your in your mind? You want to know whether or not you're you're capable of forcing, and whether or not it's important for you to force or not. This was really good. Fly are actually making a really weird call here. So Fly has no vision on this side of the jungle. In fact, let's go back a little bit further just to see if Fly had any knowledge on what was going on. Fly took the bottom tower. Riven's got to be holding a bit of gold. I feel like she's had those two items for a while. I don't, I don't know. So if, if she's holding under a thousand gold, this is maybe fine. But if she's holding over a thousand gold, like, I mean, hell, that's that's ten lethal lethality. Okay. So let's pay attention to the map. Braum and Ezreal clear a ward. They sweep the entire area. They get top push. 
this is all pretty standard. Scion goes to clean up the Riven push. Oh no, Riven does back before she ends up teleporting, okay? This is all standard from both teams. CG have complete control of the area. They just didn't know... Fly just didn't know where, where Karthus was. I'm sorry, that, what, that like wouldn't pause for me. So, so, CG take complete control of this area. Like, this is really great. This is really great by CG. They take completely control of an area, and they're able to capitalize on this. Because I don't know who made this call. Holy shit, he was holding, like, 2,100 gold. Um, I don't know who made this call for, for Viper's TP. But it's really, um, for, for lack of a better word, ambitious. So there's not a, there's not a whole lot of hope for, for Fly to win a fight here. Um, what they would rather do is just sit and wave clear, and their best way to, their best way to wave clear is is probably just trying to rely on Zoe, um, maybe using uh, cues from Wild Turtles, um, but trying to trying to get a fight in just like won't be beneficial for them. Not at this point in the game. Ezreal's too strong right now. He's at three items, and he's only just getting stronger as the minute goes as the minutes go by. Up until about when he peaks, and when he peaks at those four items, because it doesn't look like he's going for for the the build that I'm thinking about. He's not going for like the super awesome mega carry build. Um, he's definitely he's on a peak, and once that Archangel's hits and he gets this item. He's going to be peaked, and then he's going to start going downhill. His last item will probably be Guardian's Angel. And, you know, there's definitely other items that he could have bought that would have been more damaging. What, what, what happened here? Okay, so CG's now ready to back. They're holding on to a bunch of gold. They're separated, and they're in a choke point. Karthus isn't in the fight. LeBlanc's not in the fight, and LeBlanc has a bad angle. This is not this is not an angle that LeBlanc wants. They get zoned by a Zoe bubble in a choke point. And then they just get mega raped. Yeah, that that was not where Demonte wanted to be. Is there any other bad conditions for this fight? Other than possibly trying to engage onto JJ in a choke point, like was it a good idea to engage onto someone in a choke point because you think it's going to be an easy pick and you're probably going to one-shot him? Yes, I can definitely see why CG would make this play. But I also see that that person has flash, and if you if you're trying to get people that have flashes, you probably want to force their flash in two ways. One, um, get a pick. Because a pick, like killing someone with a pick or just taking their flash is, is about equivalent in value. And then two, you want to try and, and fight in open areas. And I, I, I know that I was talking about whether or not CG's on pace in terms of winning the game. But by the time by the time they're actually able to do anything, Scion's already dead. Like Scion's out of the fight before these four are even able to be in the fight. Demonte just entered. Scion had to flash away. Piglet's been kind of in the fight. He's been able to do a little bit of damage. Lyra might have hit one Q, and he's he says Karthus. Generally, Karthus is just gonna walk in and basically suicide. Um, and then, I mean, Braum's just a defense champion. Like, he can't do anything except really defend Piglet right now. So this is this is just really bad geography. They want to fight in an open area. They want it to be around Baron. They want it to be around, um, around Dragon. Or they want it to be in a big lane. Like, it can be around a turret. 
It just needs to be in, in their terms of favor. Because this, this made no sense. I mean, it made sense. I could see why the mistake was made. Like, it's a very understandable mistake. But the the... There was clearly a lack of understanding of how, how those champions interacted. Viper didn't get the ult timing right. Alright, so that just completely turned around the game. So let's let's go back to when CG took the mid tower. See, they get mid tower, and they're up 400 gold. Oh, possibly 500, 600 gold. Okay, so they're up 600 gold. Power play, ace, oh geez, I went way too far. Power play, ace. That's the replay? Where the hell did I go? Oh my god, where would I, where am I? Here, here's where I want to be. Okay, here's my power play, ace. Okay, so now fly is up. 3,000. So about a, about a 3,700 power play, which will then be a 5,200 power play after Baron. That's that's actually really really nice. Yeah, CG CG was playing this game really good. Uh, this this was just a horrible mistake that they did not understand. There was definitely some bad communication involved with this. Um, I'm pretty sure that they had all of the variables, uh, like they had all the knowledge necessary to not let that happen, um, but they were just not applying it. When did that happen again? Definitely close to here. Okay, so like here's all the knowledge it will be given to them here so the only knowledge that they don't have right now is I'm pretty sure they do not know the whereabouts of Lee Sin unless they had that worded but I don't know if they worded that no okay, so they see Zoe there they see Thresh and they see Kaisa. So this is tough because this effectively loses the game. Like there's no I I don't I don't think there's a real reason for me to look forward into the game like past the point of when FlyQuest gets barren because of just the sheer difference in 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 numbers that we're going to be looking at like there's a cs lead in every lane from fly but the cs lead in top lane is like 70 and like that's to be expected sure but it's it's also just really depressing so before scion ulted here i just want to make note that CG has no idea where Lee Sin or Riven are. So, so Lee Sin and Riven are effectively, um, they're effectively off the, off the map. It's not there. So they're grayed out. I just grayed them out for you. So they were playing with this information they were playing with the information that they had recently spotted zoe over here and that thresh had walked into this choke point and that kaisa had used a w here to to check forward through the bush because it's possible that cg might not know that they have a pink word there and that that's probably the case since they hadn't cleared it so cg say that they're they're mostly grouped, 
Now here's the problem. So Scion goes in. Lyra is going around because Lyra doesn't want to get caught in the choke point. I actually I don't even know if I agree with that because maybe it was maybe there was some kind of miscommunication here. And I think it I think it has nothing to do with Piglet and Vulcan. I'm gonna leave these guys out of it. It's definitely between these three. This guy is not coming yet. So he says, Demonte says, I'm not there. And here's here's the variable. Uncertain. Where Lee and Riven are. So that's there's the variable that we're looking at. So Demonte's shouting, I'm not there. Lyra's conflicted because he could have ran in already in front of Brahm. I mean, I suppose I could look back. I don't even think Lear ever really wanted to go in. Like, like Lear would would not be moving moving over here if Lear ever wanted to be going in. I want to pause this at the right moment where I drew my graphic. So, so Demonte says, I'm not there. Lyra says, this isn't a great fight. This isn't the right time. And Huni says, this is a possible opportunity. Now I want to be very clear with what I'm about to say because I I do not want anyone thinking that this was Huni's call because I don't think Huni is a shot caller. I really don't. I, I don't think that Huni would make this call. And I don't think Vulcan's a shot caller. He could be. I don't think Piglet's the shot caller because I, there's not that many shot calling ADCs ever. Um, there's a couple, there's just not that many. And I doubt this was DeMonte's call. This could have something to do with DeMonte. DeMonte might be supporting this decision. But he's not there yet. He's not ready to be able to participate in the fight, nor if the fight starts now, will he be in a good position to fight without being killed like instantly. And I, I don't think Lyra, I really don't think Lyra wants to fight this at all. Because if we go back, like who is that, who is that recalling? Who is that recalling there? That was Scion. That's really interesting. Yeah, if Scion wanted to recall, I really don't think that, that it was Hooney's decision. But Hooney will definitely go in if someone tells him to and he's playing a tank. So this is this is clear clear miscommunication. Whatever. Spelling. And it it causes it causes C uh Clutch to have like I mean they had some tempo and 
it ended up being something that loses the game. So continuing the power play, continuing the power play of um, of what happened in uh, during that fight. So we we were talking about CG was a little bit ahead. So the power play ends when Baron buff ends, or when the enemy team does a full reset. So the first full reset happens at 33.22, and Fly is now up, what is that, at 57? That's less gold than I thought. I mean, it's 4,500 gold. That's post Baron, post three turrets, so interesting. But they still have a Baron buff. So I doubt I doubt really that there's anything that CG can do. A Zoe at this point in the game is really annoying. LeBlanc's just not ahead enough to be to be more useful. Huni doesn't have any control over his side lane. They try to save bot. But it's not worth it. They were supposed to give bot probably, and then you can try and defend under double towers. Lose top. Not not like it really matters what they give and, and don't give at this point. It's more of like where can they best fight? Maybe if Riven's in bot, maybe they can try and do something in top by all inning, and then maybe if that fight goes quickly, they can. Use the 5v4 in top to defend Nexus Towers and maybe just generate a little bit of gold, take away some Baron buffs, relieve pressure, maybe try and do something. But remember, like after that one fight that I've already analyzed way more than it was probably necessary, um, this game is, is just in the bag for FlyQuest, which I find really depressing. Because CG, CG I'll bite drafting Karthus played this really well because remember Karthus is a late game scaling champion but he's not providing the tools that CG would have liked to have in their win condition does he provide the tools of like having a good having like a decent team fight but like I think there's a lot of champions that could provide those tools that were not the champions that were banned Nocturne and Jarvan and Olaf and Olaf's not a, a team fighting champion Jarvan is. Um, and Nocturne's actually decent for, for flanking and stuff like LeBlanc. Um, just because of his ultimate taking away vision from the enemy, it can be... Like, that's that's actually the most useful part about Nocturne. So, FlyQuest go ahead and they take this game really slowly and really seriously. CG are looking like they, they want to make their last stand. They don't want to. They don't want to pull the trigger. Like they have. They have to pull the trigger. Like Tooney pulled the trigger because they have to. But like if they want to like try to win this game, they might as well try to win it with dignity. Or like right now they're just playing for KDAs by not taking a fight five v four. Even if even if like even if they lose four v five, like like what else could they lose this game? Like what what else is going on? Like Riven's gonna take the base by herself. Like you're probably gonna lose anyway. Maybe you can, maybe you can kill the entire enemy team and get back there. I don't know. Man, fly, fly really is taking their sweet time and and finishing this game. They want to make sure that they don't make any mistakes. Yeah. Okay. So. <sighs> This is tough. This is really tough. So CG has some clear issues going on. Um, let's go ahead. Who does CG play? See, oh yeah, that's right. We already talked about who CG plays um, this week. This is week. Uh, this is week five. And then week six, 
Are there no buys on week six? They just restart the pattern. There's ten teams. So there's nine games per per round robin. So Saturday, Clutch plays 100 Thieves on March 2nd. Clutch plays Optic. Yeah, Echo Fox is their first game. Then TSM. Does it change the order of the games, this split? Clutch plays 100 Thieves for week 6. So if you play two teams a week, that should take you five weeks to play all the teams. I don't think Clutch played Golden Guardians, did they? No, they didn't. Well, I don't know, maybe I just can't count. Looking at it on the Google on the Google calendar is a little bit weird, but But Clutch needs to fix something fast. And I think the first thing that they need to fix is they they very clearly have a style of gameplay that they want. And I think they need to attack that. Oops, spelling. And they definitely need to attempt to fix some of these miscommunication errors that lead to like really silly calls that 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 just always happen. Um, there are, and like sometimes a rash call is necessary. But like that rash call, um, Hooney's engaged, Hooney dying before Demonte gets to the fight, Lyra literally just not being in the fight, like that was clear miscommunication, the engage was rash, it was unnecessary, they were probably trying to get someone to back, they were, it, there was not any fear of the enemy taking Baron, they had a small lead, they had just pushed mid, like everything was fine for them to back. Um... But they, they can't have any more rash decisions if they want to stay in this league. Otherwise, like CG actually had a really good game. CG CG played really well today, or well, Sunday. And for a while there, I thought that I was looking at a team that that actually hadn't had very seriously improved but some of the same some of the same problems came out in this game that come out in a lot of games and that's definitely an issue okay well thank you guys for watching so feel free to to like and comment um definitely leave some feedback or or let me ask me any questions or let me know um if you if you like if you like it or you or you would like other formats or you would like other content um, you can email me if you uh, if you want personal coaching or coaching for your team um, and you can definitely subscribe to stay tuned for more content or look for me on twitter have a good night thank you